Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining the Derek Arden Chat Show. Today, we're going to talk about negotiation and neurolinguistic programming, NLP, as it's known. But in simple terms, the art and science of excellence, modelling what really high achievers do. And uh, I've been fascinated by the psychology of NLP uh, ever since I first came across it. As you know, I've uh, been studying negotiations for virtually all my life, particularly at the Harvard Business School, and teaching people negotiation. Today, I've got Gabrielle Gachet with me, who's an NLP expert. I don't pretend to be an NLP expert, but I like to call myself a negotiation expert. We've worked together with some high-profile FTSE 100 clients, and uh, every now and again, we do a program for people on advanced negotiation skills linked to neurolinguistics. So if you want to know more about that, then email me, please. Um, so, why do people not negotiate? The actual research into that says they are scared to ask quite often. Why are they scared to ask? Because they might get rejection. And if they get rejection, they'll worry, but they can just get over it because what have you got to lose? Uh, just a bit of your self pride and that makes them less confident. I'm surprised, but it happens with lawyers, with accountants, and with all sorts of people. In fact, I did some work for a high profile law firm in the city of London, and I did a poll, and 62% of these lawyers didn't feel confident about negotiating. And I was staggered by that, and I thought, wow, I wouldn't want you negotiating for me. I'd probably want to do my own negotiations if that was the case. But today we're going to talk about neurolinguistics and negotiating. And the first point I want to make is that uh, managing your own state. So managing your own state, your own mood, the frame of mind you're in is critical to uh, negotiation. So are you in what I call a negotiator's state? What's a negotiator's state? A negotiator's state, which is one that says, I understand everything's negotiable. I understand if someone says it's not negotiable, it probably is. I just need to come from a different direction. I'm up for it. I'm confident. I've used a confidence anchor. I've triggered one of my confident anchors, which might be to pinch yourself hard there, might be to give yourself a slap or whatever it is before you go into the meeting and I'm ready for it and I'm early and I'm ready to shake hands when we can shake hands with the other people and I'm ready to connect with them. So are you in the right frame of mind? Are you in the right state? Or are you in a right state, as some people say? Gabby, what's your take on state and negotiation? So the most important thing is that whatever states you want to create in your client, in your audience, you go there first. So it could be that you want to create an element of fear to, to make the problem that they potentially have even worse and you have to go to that fearful place first and then to the to the passion of, of resolving the problem and then the belief that you can make a difference whatever state you want to create in your client you must go there first and they will catch it off you because we are magnets and and they will catch it from you now, this is one of the things that people forget to do in their preparation. They go into the meeting. Sometimes they're fearful themselves before they go into the meeting because they're worried about what they're going to lose. They're worried about losing their ego, losing some money and things like that. So actually making sure you're in the right frame of mind and the right state. And to do that, you need to get to the meeting early. You need to get to the meeting room early. And the things we talked about uh, on some of the other uh, you know, don't be on time, be early, David Heiner says, and that's absolutely right. When he said it and the way he said it at a conference, I thought, oh, don't be, don't be on time. And he said, no, don't be on time. That's terrible. Be early and be ready. So number two is goal setting. Now you say goal setting. Well, we should all set goals, but we know most people don't set goals. They drift through life, not knowing what they want, uh, wondering how they got to where they've got to, etc. But goal setting in your life, Goal setting in your business, goal setting in your career is absolutely vital. So why wouldn't you goal, set a goal for the negotiation outcome that you want? So my outcome here is to get a win-win with the client. So the client loves me and we get lots of other business. Or it might be you're buying a car 
and you want to get absolutely the rock bottom deal on that car because we all come out of a car showroom thinking we got a fantastic deal and you know when we when we look back on it we found oh, i'm not really sure i got much of a deal anyway and the way the car sales person comes out and shakes your hand with a big grin on their face you think well they made a lot of commission out of me how did that work so what's the goal for the negotiation and therefore at that point you need to decide what's the best position i want what's the target position what's the walk away where i will walk away and if i do walk away what's the alternative position and what i mean by alternative position is so i've walked away what will i do with the money what will i do with the resources so if i'm buying a car will i buy a different car perhaps i'll keep my own car for another year there are all sorts of options when i'm coaching people on negotiation often they say to me derek but i have no options i'm said i'm sorry you always have options they might not be very pleasant you might not want to do them but you can always sell your house downsize move somewhere else or whatever it is you can change your job to go to a job that's less stressful you might have to downside your house at that point to have enough money to live but there are always options and that's why you need friends and mentors that can talk you through that when you're emotionally wound up so set the goal for everything you want in life and set the goal for each one of your negotiations over to you gabby so we've talked about well-formed outcomes in previous chats and having a well-formed outcome is absolutely key and when Derek talks about the alternative, it could be that you don't get the deal that you want, but you get a much stronger relationship. And relationships are as important and the value of the relationships and the quality of the relationships can be as important as the monetary side of things. So when you're thinking about negotiation and the goal around it, think holistically. It's not just about the negotiation, it's about the people, the future opportunities as well. And of course, when we talk about negotiating, it's not just about price, it's about all the extras, it's about the relationship, as uh, Gabby said, the relationship going forward, what else you might earn from that client, what else you might earn from the relationship. Like the relationship we've got here, I never thought for one moment, setting this up 33 uh, calls ago, I would have made, made and renewed so many friendships. It's absolutely fantastic and learned so much. I met Jill, who's uh, been taking notes for the last so it's absolutely awesome you never know what you don't know until you know it is that a trouble negative i'll come back on that later number three building rapport people say to me well these are all the things at the start there yeah they are because if you get the start right then you'll get the finish right i often say to people oh, when they ask me how to close sales i said well you need to make sure you open the sale properly with the first impressions so why is rapport so important? People buy, people are influenced, people do better negotiation deals with people they like. People like people like themselves. So by building rapport, connecting with the person, remembering what they're interested in, remembering where they go on holiday, remembering their families, names and things makes the world go round much better. Some people say to me, isn't that manipulative? No, of course it's not manipulative. It's just being nice. It's just being friendly. It's just being connected. And the real benefit of rapport is when you're in rapport, you can ask much more difficult questions and you're more likely to get much better answers. The quality of the questions you ask depends on the quality. The quality of the answers you get depends on the quality of the questions that you ask and you can ask more difficult questions. Then we go on to some of the art and science of, uh, of uh, uh, NLP, which is uh, if you mirror the body language of the person, if you mirror the tone of voice and the speed of the voice they're talking at, and you mirror the language they use in their unconscious mind, below the level of awareness, they will think that you are like them. You come from the same part of the country you come from the same from a different country but you're connected via our smart via the speaking friends you're connected because you're a fan of uh, neurolinguistics or psychology or whatever people like people that are like them gabby what can you add for me there so you've talked about matching and mirroring and that the the more flexible you are the more people you're going to be able to be in rapport with 
And initially, it can take an effort from you to build the rapport. Uh, but the, the easiest way to build rapport, I have found, and I have flexed and changed my voice, changed my phraseology, changed the, the words that I'm using. But the easiest way for me is matching the breathing patterns and matching the phraseology. So the speaking, either in a staccato way, the speed of, of speech, but it's the breathing. And actually, when you get into the, the breath pattern of someone else, you tend to speak more in the phraseology that they speak in. That's really interesting. So people go, when I, when I mention this, people go, come on, Derek, you've now lost the plot. You match the breathing of the person you're networking with. And I say, yeah, absolutely. Because, if you can, if, because people that are hyperventilating, that are stressed and might be stressed in a negotiation are breathing at 15, 16 uh, breaths a minute. And that's, uh, whereas someone like Gabby, you know, is always chilled out and cool, breathes at about four breaths a minute you know as she drinks a chamomile tea or a, or whatever it or whatever it is but um yeah no ab absolutely and i think that came from milton erickson didn't it who was modeling people who um modeling people who were totally stressed out and he mirrored their breathing before he started mirroring their body language etc and he spent hours and hours and hours on people who sad serious psychotherapy points so we've covered state goals and rapport now we come to questioning and listening and at that point can i ask anybody to put questions in the chat box please because that would be very useful the quality of the questions as you ask determines the quality of the answers you get the real thing is that you need to think through the questions that you ask in advance prepare them on in your magic book wherever you do so you've got the notes there and the questions that you're going to ask and in negotiating some of the questions are really simple you know um is and is your best price not a good question because that's a closed question and people are generally going to say yes uh, what can you do to help me on price is a lot better and if you remember shelly shelly rose chave on monday uh which is on the uh, latest youtube clip she said is there anything you can do to help me on price. There's a huge benefit to dropping your voice tonality, maybe moving your head like your dog or your cat does just a little bit to empathize and then ask the difficult question quietly. Uh, what can you do to help me on price? Because I have better offers than you put on the table and etc. like that. Then it all comes down to listening, doesn't it? And listening with your two ears and your two eyes and we'll come to body language next but your two ear we have two ears and two eyes to pick up the sensory acuity in other words what people are really saying what they're not saying how they're saying it and what they're saying with their body language etc because we need to pick up signals when we're negotiating with people if someone says oh yeah kevin that's a fantastic idea i really think that uh, we might be able to go ahead with that you know, generally people don't pick up those signals when I'm standing on the stage in front of an audience saying that. And of course, I've given three deceit signals immediately there. I've rubbed my nose. Pinocchio's nose grew every time he told a lie. We get a little tingling feeling around here when people are telling fibs or when we're telling fibs. Moved backwards away. So that's away from closing the deal. People move forward when they're ready to agree with you. They move back. And folding your arms is protected your heart, which is the biggest defensive one at all. Some people say, well, I just felt cold or I just moved back. Doesn't matter. Just take it. It's you ask a question, they move back. You're not going to close the sale. Fold your arms, mirror their body language, etc. Um, move forward. Gabby, anything to add to questions and listening, please? So the questions can take people into more of the problem or more of the solution. So be mindful of where you want to direct um, their attention. And just to give you an example, uh, what would you do with an extra £3,000 or $3,000 a month? If you think about the answers that you come up with, it's going to be stuff. Whereas what would three having $3,000 or pounds or whatever your currency is a month do for you or give you will give you a completely different quality of answer. It will give you more the drivers, the motivation. 
behind what people are after. And that's the kind of information that is really powerful when you're negotiating. Well, peace of mind, security, freedom, knowing what people's drivers are is much more effective for you as the negotiator than what they're going to spend the stuff on. So just be mindful that the quality of the question really can determine a very, very different quality answer that will help you or hinder you. And what you're very good at, Gabby, is getting into the minds of the other person and therefore seeing what sort of person they are, like what Sir Shelley talked about, their internal dialogue, etc., so that you can actually, what you pitch is a real benefit to what they want because you've been listening crazily to exactly what they said. I don't know I've got an itchy nose there, but you know, maybe I was telling fibs, but uh, there we go. One of the problems is talking about body language as soon as you go to itch your nose or something everybody has a pop at you at that point so i'm usually standing there trying to not to itch my nose like the hay fever it's a hay fever uh, hay fever is terrible <laughs> terrible around here yeah in guildford awful awful let me come to sensory acuity and uh, body language really sensory acuity is the sort of american word for or the californian word for uh, listening and watching people through all their senses the uh, looking sense, the listening sense, the uh, uh, touching sense, the tasting sense, and the smell sense. And they all called fancy words, and I can never say them or, or remember them. So, uh, but you know, the, uh, it was Da Vinci that said the average person looks without seeing, they don't notice what's going on. And that's why I coach people like mad to take someone with them, then take a break in a negotiation so you can see how they reacted to your difficult question. You won't notice that if you go on your own. You need someone with you. You might notice it, but you're playing a bit of a lottery at that stage. Listening to exactly what they're saying. My norm, this is about our normal price. Well, we don't want your normal price. We want your special price because of our relationship. Sensing what's going on. Uh, using our intuition to sense the feel of the meeting, the mood of the meeting, the energy coming back from the other people, whether they like you or not, whether they dislike you. It's said that 5% of people you'll never like in the world and they'll never like you. And if that's the case, just move on. When Tony and I were working in Barclays, uh, we used to be in large corporate relationship management. And if the client didn't like you, the best thing to do was to change the account manager and move it on to somebody else, move her on to somebody else so that, uh, so that there was a connection. People don't buy, they're not influenced by people they don't like. And so being aware of this, and the, probably the body language is the most important thing to look at. Uh, it's five times more difficult to lie, they say, than uh, with the body language than it is with the words. But if you've got your radar on, if you've got your acuity on, and you're watching and listening and picking things up, you will pick up far more information. And uh, be careful with your own internal dialogue. I wrote down on my pad when I was writing this this morning, be careful with your own internal dialogue. Because if you say, oh, we're not gonna get a deal here to yourself, guess what will happen? You won't get a deal. Or if you're mixing with people who said, well, you'll never, never, those, with those people, you'll never close the sale. Well, if you listen to that nonsense, you'll never close the sale. Let me tell you, when I left the big organisation I worked for for a long time, people said, you'll never get a deal to leave. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Thanks for your support. Because they knew that I wanted to go out and chase my passion, not my pension. And um, I did get a deal because I didn't listen to any of that nonsense. I got a deal at the right time, in the right position, and a deal that suited me and suited the company. Gabby, anything to add on sensory acuity, please? Well, there's listening with your eyes as well as your ears. They, you know, they say two eyes, two ears, one mouth. We've all heard it before, but it's sensory acuity is very much about listening with your eyes as well as your ears. And, and there is something about being quiet on the inside. For any of creatives among you, you'll be aware of your muse, or you won't, but most people are aware of their muse if they are creative and their muse kind of gives them insights where does that information come from that in itself is a whole a zoom uh, to, to be discussed in the future but where that information comes from often 
is the energy in between you and them. If you're quiet on the inside, you will pick up information that they haven't necessarily said, but you'll just get an intuition to ask about their uncle or the kid or the whatever it might be. And pay attention to that because that is part of the sensory acuity. Fantastic, Gabby. Um, and so we're now down to the use of language, which we've already talked about. And uh, Shelley was talking about language. Gabby's talked about language before. The language you use is just so important. And Patricia Fritt on Monday, who mustn't be missed, she's fantastic, will talk about language. And uh, she's always telling me off for using the word staff, shed loads, and language like this. It's weak language. It doesn't carry forward what you do, and it doesn't enthuse people. So think about that. Kevin O'Connor wants to know how I've done that on the screen, by the way, and that will cost you another thousand dollars. Check in the post and I will explain it to you and give, give you a lesson. Uh, it's taken me hours and my, my hourly fee is, uh, is very expensive, Kevin. Um, so the language you use is very important, but the language you use to yourself, your internal dialogue, I heard, that people can spend up to two, three hours talking to themselves. Generally, that talking to yourself is negative. I don't know why. I think that's a defensive mechanism in human nature to keep us safe. But if we keep listening to the news broadcasts and reading the papers that are the most negative in the UK, the Daily Mail is, uh, doesn't have a word to good to say about anything anybody ever does. And if you go on YouTube you, and Google, I heard it in the Daily Mail, there's a very funny YouTube clip which just takes the mickey out of the Daily Mail. When I say that the people, they don't believe me. But uh, generally, people that use more negative language, I say, do you read the Daily Mail? Do you know what they say to me? Yeah, I do, actually. Oh, okay. Well, you need to get over it and uh, move on. So the language you use is very important. Now, when I'm um, negotiating a fee to talk at a conference, and whenever that comes up, and uh, if you ask me to speak at your conference, I'm giving you some of my secrets away straight away, um, people will say, um, well, what do you charge? And I sort of flap around and try, well, what do you want the books and what's included? Do you want a breakout session? Adding all the extras in that I possibly can. But when I'm pushed on price, I will say my normal price is and I'm never sure what's going to come out of my mouth, but it's going to be a high price. And that's anchoring. And the key word I've used there is normal. So if they're listening properly, they hear the word normal. I said, look, Derek, I don't want your normal prices. There's going to be for these reasons, you know, what about a special price for me and with or without my books, etc.? cetera? Uh, what, to, you know, would that help? And then I can come down. Okay, well, because it's you, Kevin, Tony, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do you a special deal, but please don't tell anyone. And the invoice will say, let's say £5,000, but for you, it will be reduced to 3750 or whatever. Now, some speakers and some people put their prices on websites. And I'm talking about speakers. If you sell a unique service and some of you do whatever it is you don't really want your prices on the website because sometimes you can give such fantastic service that actually you deserve every penny you get and when i'm helping people negotiate a sale of their business and i'm helping people negotiate something complicated and difficult then we need to agree a sensible win-win price at that point for the advice and the 30 years of experience that uh, I've, uh, I've had. Gabby, anything to add on language? Uh, Self-talk is probably one of the most um, important parts of negotiation because if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're probably right. Um, and it takes discipline. We, we hear about you know, building your physical strength. Uh, very rarely do we hear about Pick, building up your your language discipline and your language strength um, and the way that you speak to yourself is very very important the messages that you give yourself there's also um, we hear a great deal about certain things and we hear an awful lot about certain things if you're hearing an awful lot about something that's great you're sending mixed messages in your language and it's certainly one of my pet hates when I hear people saying 
you know, we've got an awful lot of great deals. Well, an awful lot of great deals doesn't, it just doesn't compute. There's, there's mixed messages in the language. So an awful lot of problems and a great deal of solutions, just as a, as a throwaway tip. Um, pay attention to what people are saying and start collecting the great phrases that you hear from other people that make you feel good because the chances are if they make you feel good they'll make someone else feel good equally if they make you feel bad like shoulding which creates guilt which we've talked about before that can create guilt in other people if that's what you want to achieve great but if that's not what you want to achieve start picking up on the, the positive things if you want to pick up language tips um, for negatives, watch the BBC News. And if you want to pick up positive tips, watch Sky Sports. Because the language on Sky Sports by the commentators and by the, um, by the people that interview people after the game, they, look, they ask leading questions of uh, sports people that have just come off a, a sports field that may not be that bright and they will use really really positive language because they're selling sky sports which sadly i pay 75 pounds a, a month for um because they don't want people like me to leave and they want it to be positive so sports is positive um and uh, and uh, usually the news is negative because negative news sells newspapers raise your sensory acuity and go out and notice that and notice the language of the sky sports uh, uh, interviewers it's clever because it leads the person what were you what were you thinking about as you took that very successful penalty or something like that so um, then the, the last thing we come on to is pattern interrupt which is um, something I took away with amusement from my uh, NLP course uh, basically pattern interrupt is where you say something or you do something for effect to scramble the other people's brains. So I have mentioned this before, but when I was chairman of the speaking association, I had a group of people when I took over who were awkward. It's one person who particularly uh, wanted to disrupt the meeting. And I thought, what do I do about this? And I thought, well, you've written about it in, uh, in Win Win. You need to put all your negotiating tactics into chairing this meeting. So I might get up while this person was talking and walk across the room and pour myself a cup of coffee that kind of throws people in disarray or get up and open the window and say something like, it's a bit hot in here the one i really like and martin's on this call which we have used and i won't get martin to tell the one that with the uh, 20p coin unless you really press him when we turn the recording off but is to go can anyone smell smoke I thought I could smell smoke. But by this time, I've got everybody with their reptilian brain working flat out. They just pumped adrenaline into their system and they're thinking, oh shit, we better be ready to get out of here. Where did he say the exit was and everything else? And then you go, no, no, it was nothing. Don't worry. And uh, then you go, I thought I could smell it again. Oh, God, well, it's really good. It's really unfair, but it's a good one. But of course, it's one of those magic tricks that you probably don't let on. When I explain it, and sometimes I explain it, they'll go, oh, well, that was a bit of a rotten thing to do. Great one to do in the graveyard, graveyard session. Great one to do between two and three o'clock uh, when uh, you know more people die between two or three o'clock in the afternoon and two or three o'clock in the morning than at any other time. So, you know, I, and then I say, well, if we get through to three o'clock, we're all right. We've... Uh, we've all made it so that's a kind of pattern interrupt as well so if anyone's got any other great pattern interrupts uh because uh, i see kevin's writing it down and stealing my ideas as usual as he does from uh, chicago please share them back the other way gabby anything to add to that one so um there are things like uh, you've got to be mindful of with a pattern interrupt what outcome are you aiming for by having a pattern interrupt and for me, it's when things are getting a little bit too intense. It's just something to lighten the mood. So planning interrupt can be moving, asking them to move, looking at a different view. In NLP, there's something called meta programs and you get the random and the logical. So we have a, a preference to 
how information is given to us either logically or as a random and people that are random will not be as affected by a pattern interrupt because they are used to darting from one place to another i call them butterflies um, whereas often it's the people that are very very logical that they can get very drawn into the detail and it can all get a bit heavy but at that point having a pattern interrupt and doing a random can be very effective because it just gets them out of where they are and then when they go back in they've got a new perspective a fresh perspective as as a as a youngster i used to smoke and one of the things that i found is that when i left the office kind of laden with issues by the time i came back actually i had solutions and was able to deal with things more effectively and you can do that by just by you know going to the loo getting a, a drink walking away and coming back and when you're in a meeting it could be that you say would you like a drink should we should we take a break there for a coffee whatever it might be it's just breaking the state when the state is not an effective state we started off with state so this kind of brings us full circle we started off with states if the state that you find yourself being drawn into isn't the one that that you is going to be effective you want to move it across to something else and a pattern interrupt is a great way of doing that and sometimes you need to pattern interrupt your own thinking as well because your own thinking gets it into a negative state and therefore exactly. you need to remind yourself i actually wake up in the mornings uh, generally a bit grumpy and in a negative state so i have to take control of that i don't know why it is in the mornings it may be something to do with the hormones and how the brain works i okay. I, I don't know coffee seems to work that's a pattern interrupt but those of you that follow me on linkedin you see that i've been posting at 6 30 in the morning pictures of my potatoes growing in the garden and looking through i posted a picture this morning looking through jill's notes actually uh, sitting by my potatoes in the garden that's a serious pattern interrupt because a robin comes down and says hello um and you can think the robin could be anybody so you know it's really really odd but you need to sort it out yourself my pattern interrupt was to go over starbucks over the road and have a coffee but i've been banned from that for the last uh, 10 weeks so we talked about there i'm just going to summarize um thousand the price has just gone up, Kevin, because you didn't agree to pay the money. And so you missed the sale opportunity. So we talked about state, we talked about goals, we talked about rapport, we talked about question and listening, sensory acuity language and pattern interrupt. After I came back from Harvard studying negotiation, I then went on the NL two NLP courses to see how I could link this in to helping people with their negotiations. And uh, it's certainly happened as you can see i think i've spelt pattern interrupt wrong on the slide when i did the slide and then put the slide into the virtual background so we've got one or two questions in the question box and then i'll ask martin if he's up for it to tell this um when we worked together this story he used to tell at two o'clock in the afternoon which i banned him from because at one stage I thought my professional indemnity policy probably wouldn't pay out if he kept doing it. So if, you, if you're up for that, Marty, uh, you can't answer because you're on mute. Um, so the questions we have, one from Andrew, if someone is very nervous, are you suggesting you should mirror that by also appearing nervous? I think you've already answered that, Gabby, but uh, um, I, I don't think we should appear nervous. This is my answer. I think we should be mirroring their body language and mirroring their concern and therefore if they're leaning back then you lean back etc but you don't want to encourage their pattern but you want to get them out the pattern so maybe you get them out the pattern with a pattern interrupt words a language and then you'd move your body language forward maybe which is called pacing and leading yeah gabby can you add to that so one of one of the things that I do is pattern interrupt when I see that people are nervous, dependent on the scenario. She says desperately going through the various different scenarios in my mind, um, but I will often call them on it. So I'll say, you know, I, you appear to be nervous. What can I do to calm you down? Because, again, just in asking that question, what can I do to calm you down or what will make it easier for you? They have to go to being easier and calmer 
to be able to answer the question. Um, and generally what will happen is they'll immediately calm down. So it's a great way of building um, the, the rapport and also showing your empathy. Some people might take that the wrong way, I guess. It's like if you tell someone, oh, you look tired. It's like, what do you mean I look tired? It's kind of, I'm not nervous, even if they are. I'm um, just wondering if that may some occasions basically. So again, that, that's what I'm saying. It depends on, on the situation and how well you know the person. Obviously, if you know the person, you'll understand. I do a lot of uh, t training and coaching around public speaking. And um, nine times out of ten, it's because they're nervous and they're absolutely pooping themselves. So um, in that scenario, I, I will ask them questions to begin to notice what is going on for them. Um, I'm thinking more in a negotiation though. If you're okay, so happy to, they're public about to speak and they seem nervous, I'm sure they're happy to be calmed down. But if you're about to negotiate the price of the car, for example, and the car salesman says you seem nervous. But the car salesman would be happy if they're nervous because that means yeah, they might be. Yes, so, yes. Actually, probably. <laughs> so that it, it really is uh, scenario dependent. If you are wanting to get the person to calm down, then you need to go to that place first because we are human Wi-Fi and they will catch, whoever has the strongest state will catch it from the other person. So if you want to, to calm people down, then you need to go to an even calmer place so that they can go with you. Um, right. I'm so frustrated that they, they do something to interrupt their own pattern. I wonder if self uh, um, uh, self disclosure works as well. That we say, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little jittery right now, or I feel a little. I just feel kind of funny. I don't know. Do you feel that way too? So we we put the state in first, which allows them to uh, create some empathy, and they might then feel safer. Uh, I think especially men who seem to have an issue sometimes with uh, disclosing emotion. Yeah. No. I, I think that's that's uh, that's a good one. Kevin, Jane, Jane Gunn talked on um, the mediation session, didn't she, which was two weeks ago about uh, calming people down as well, uh, taking a time out, um, etc. Um, managing your own state's a good one as well to talk about because you just mentioned that, Gabby, and uh, certainly I'm always uh, a bit anxious before I do a talk, before I meet new people. I find that's healthy, so it, it should be, but you know, so what, what is my state? How do I manage my own state? Well, I'll tell you one thing someone told me once was to, uh, when you're doing your little bit of fresh air and your deep breathing, use Bach Rescue Remedy, B-A-C-H, Rescue Remedy, which they give to dogs. Now, I don't know if it works or not, but I bought some in boots for three pounds, squirted it there, and I was fine. I think it was probably a placebo, who knows? It doesn't matter, does it, if it works, it, it works and if you know if you're doing something important if you're you know and andrew's andrew's a lawyer i know and lots of people come to lawyers and they're going to be nervous aren't they because it's very important to them not nervous necessarily with the lawyer but nervous with the issues that they're they're facing i think uh, i like both of those and i think the answer to your question andrew it depends what works for who and uh, one of the things that nlp is it gives you different resources for different different people one other, one other way of doing it is to have some stories of, I have some clients that come to me and they are very nervous because we've not met before. And what we found, the feel felt found, um, you might have come mm. across, um, and, and ha create some stories that are going to be similar to the situation that they're in. So that the person can feel empathy with the story and empathy with the people that you're talking about and the journey that they went from being nervous to feeling confident in and trusting in your services. Stories are really- I think, I think what you're both saying is that there are some limits and qualifications to the idea of matching and mirroring, because the idea of matching and mirroring, generally that's the right thing to do, but obviously it's not always the, the thing to do. You know, the guy across the other desk, other side of the desk tries to punch you in the negotiation, you don't mirror it by trying to punch him back. If they're quivering with fear, you don't mirror it with quivering with fear. So I think we're saying generally match and mirror, but there are some exceptional forms of behavior where it, you do something different. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Or, yeah, I think, or, yeah. I think too, if he tried to, if he tried to hit me, I'd smell some smoke. 
So uh, <laughs> you wouldn't be quick enough, Kevin. Yeah. Tyson, Tyson Fury always beats you, uh, you Americans out in Vegas. So uh, he's our man. Um, I'm, we're almost coming yeah. to the to the end of the recorded session, if that's all right with with um, with everybody. Um, I'm just going to ask Martin if he's there. I'm going to unmute everybody and just to tell this pattern interrupter um, game, well, a game, what we did on one or two people till I worried about my professional indemnity insurance. Martin, are you there? Yes, you I got, am. You've got a yeah. minute. Um, well, uh, the scenario is typically a training room with uh, 15, 20 people in. I'm not thinking of large conferences and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you've had a, it's a one day, at least one day course, and you've had lunch, and then you come back from lunch, and you you know that everything, everyone in the classroom, apart from you, perhaps including you, all they want to do is go to sleep while they digest the food that they've just consumed. And uh, one way to pattern interrupt that to present prevent them doing so is to tell them that at the beginning of the day before they arrived, so it's purely random. You still have taped a one pound or one dollar coin to the underside of one of the seats. And the idea was that after lunch, the person who'd got that coin under their seat would be invited to step up to the front and summarize the morning session by bringing out the three key learning points. Well, to see the body language when you announce that from the front of the room is quite, quite amazing. Um, and I've never yet called upon anybody to come up and do it, but you get the reaction just by threatening to do so. And it, they're immediately sitting straight and uh, sitting up straight and paying attention. But the other thing more seriously is that when they're in that state, you need to be giving them something to do rather than carry on talking. So they need to be, uh, they need to be uh, doing, taking some sort of action. And just using this thing about language, I've learned over many years, there are certain phrases that delegates do not like. So if you say to a group of delegates, right, you need to get some practical negotiation skills. Now we've talked about the theory. So we are going to do a role play. Never use role play to a classroom of delegates. They hate it. Use anything else, simulation, micro simulation, practical exercise. Do not use role play because it's linked to acting and they don't want to act. Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's me. That's me. Yeah, no, thanks, Martin. That's absolutely uh, fantastic. Well, I was at the back of the room and of course I was the uh, person that the uh, client was employing and uh, Martin was uh, assisting me as he always does, having a bit of fun. But uh, there was a guy in the room who had gone sheet white and his blood pressure was obviously operating at about uh, 200 over 120. He should have probably been dead at that point. And uh, I'm thinking, we, sh we can't keep doing this. Marty is so believable. And uh, this guy obviously thinks it's going to be him and he's going to pass out. And I thought my professional indemnity policy will never pay out. I'll need Andrew Schindler to defend me in court or something over this. So I said, we, we can't do this again. Well, I just felt that was totally over the top martin did persuade me to do it once more again but uh, never again guys we've uh, we've come to the um come to the end of the uh, recorded session so i'm going to turn the recording off in a, in a minute and then you can um ask us any questions you like uh, feel free to but thanks for joining us thanks for watching on youtube really appreciate that thanks for listening to it on the uh, negotiators podcast you know where you can find me www.derekarden.com co.uk or on my youtube channel there's uh, over 140 videos now so thanks for joining me and remember everything is negotiable <laughs>